Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So today I have a special device to show off, and this is called the FunKey S. Now I've had this for a couple weeks now, and I think it's about time to do a deep dive review on this, because there's some really interesting things about this device. For starters, it actually raised over 165,000 euros on Kickstarter over this past year, and I was one of over 2,000 backers on its initial Kickstarter campaign. And that's a pretty impressive feat for a retro gaming handheld like this. And I think part of that charm comes from the fact that it looks a lot like a Game Boy Advance SP, but then also this thing is tiny. It weighs only one ounce. And as impressive as that is, you're probably questioning whether or not that size is actually manageable, is it something you're gonna actually enjoy playing on? And so that's what I wanna dive into with this review, is to see whether or not this is worth your money. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, so let's start with some specs. This thing runs on an all-winner V3S chipset, which has an ARM Cortex-A7 1.2 GHz CPU, which is pretty impressive when you think about it. Now this SoC only has 64 megabytes of RAM built in, so that's the max you're going to get on this device. It contains a 1.52 inch ISP LCD display that runs at a 50 Hz refresh rate. It has a 240x240 240 resolution, which means it's a square screen, and therefore has a 1x1 aspect ratio. But there is a scaling option on most of these emulators to allow you to adjust it to the native aspect ratio. The device has a 410 milliamp hour battery, which results in about 2 hours average playing time. It has a half watt mono speaker and a micro USB port for charging as well as for transferring over data. Now this device is currently selling for 65 euros or $75 altogether. And while that seems like a pretty hefty price, it is definitely a quality device. As we go through, I'll talk more about that. Now, what do you get for that $75? What kind of games do you get to play? Well, you can basically play the entire spectrum of 8-bit and 16-bit games on this. All the classics from the Nintendo era, all the way up through PlayStation 1. And then on the handheld side, you can play everything from Game Boy through Game Boy Advance, as well as some of the more lesser known handheld systems like the Atari Lynx, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and Wonderswan Color. Overall, if you're a 90s kid, this is going to be a perfect fit for you in terms of the games you can play. Okay, let's do a quick unboxing here. Now the box that it came in was pretty big and I was like, oh, I thought this thing was small. But then I opened it up and there's a smaller box. It's kind of like Inception. And inside this, you'll never guess, was another box. Overall, I really like the packaging. It's neat and simple, but very well made. Inside, you can see there are swappable buttons. We'll do that later in this video. You have a micro USB charging cord, and then just a quick manual. Okay, so here's the device itself. I find it interesting that it actually comes with a keychain thing, which is also easy to remove, and it's what I've done on my own. Now, there's not a lot on the outside. You can see it has the shoulder buttons protruding here, and they are very clicky, very micro switchy feeling. And then you have your micro USB charging port. But that's it, no on or off or anything else like that. Now on the inside you can see it has a D-pad, ABXY buttons, a menu button, a function button, which also works as a select button, as well as the start button. It has a little LED charging indicator light there as well. And you can see that although it has dual speaker holes like this, there's only one speaker. So I think the second one is just cosmetic or to allow sound to escape through that other side as well. Now these buttons are very clicky, so I'm just going to be quiet and kind of let this play through here for a second. So these buttons are super clicky and pretty loud, so it's really going to be up to you whether or not you prefer this kind of gameplay. So all you have to do to start up the system is actually just open it up. It has a little indicator that knows when you've opened it. Boot up time on this is very fast, it's about 5 or 6 seconds, which is very impressive. Overall it has a very simple and lightweight interface to it. It looks to me a lot like Simple Menu, which you have on the RG350 devices. And if you've ever tried any of these handheld devices before, you know the drill, you basically just pick your system, and then you navigate through your games. Now this doesn't come preloaded with commercial games, you're going to have to load them yourself, but it's very simple to do, I'll show you how to do that later, as well as the box art. When you press the menu button, you're going to see all sorts of options. For example, volume or powering off the system or even changing the launcher, which we'll show later. And then also setting your theme and brightness. Let's change some themes out and let you see what they are. So let's test out some of these themes so you can see what they look like. The first one here is called just a flat theme, and this is very similar to what you would find on simple menu. 
Here's the TFT theme. This is probably my favorite. And then finally you have the funky theme. And this one's okay, it's a lot of purple. I think I just got enough purple with the device itself. I don't need to see more of it. Okay, let's compare against other models. Here's the Trim UI Model S. Now I think this has about a two inch screen here and you can see here, it's a pretty big difference. And then when you compare it against some bigger devices like the RG280V from Ambernick, which really just dwarfs it. And then same thing here with the Pal Kitty V90. In reality, the Funky S is about half the size of the Pal Kitty V90. So this thing, yeah, is it's tiny. I don't have anything else to compare it to. Now when starting up a game, everything kind of runs at that full screen, one by one resolution, but you can go and you can hit the function and down button to change the different aspect ratios. And it's gonna vary depending on what system you're using. You can see here with Super Nintendo, you can crop it down. Now when actually playing games, there were three things that really struck me right off the bat. The first was the gameplay itself is pretty difficult. Because these buttons are so cramped together, it's very difficult to play any game that requires you to push more than one button at a time. I don't consider myself to have large hands, but I was still having a very hard time playing this. The second thing that really struck me is how well this system actually plays. You can see here with Super Mario World 2 on the Super Nintendo, and it's playing beautifully. Now unfortunately this emulator doesn't show your frames per second or anything else like that, but this is still very smooth gameplay for a device like this. And the third thing that really impressed upon me was how bad the sound is coming out of the speaker. I'm just going to let it play for you here, and you can just hear the difference. So yeah, unfortunately, any of these games that come on the Super Nintendo, and especially PlayStation, any of those that are a little bit harder to run, the sound quality on this is just terrible. If you try to play it loud enough to be able to hear, you're going to get terrible crackling. If you turn it down, you're not going to actually be able to hear anything. So in general, the sound on this is very poor. I wouldn't expect to be able to basically just hear a lot of your games. And unfortunately, there's no headphone jack either, so that really you have no option to hear some of these games clearly. Otherwise, gameplay on this is as you would expect. NES is just great. Game Boy plays just fine. And I would say that Game Boy is probably one of the best on this because of the size of the screen. It's just made for a smaller screen, and therefore it's not so hard to see everything. And same goes with Game Boy Color, obviously. Now something like Game Boy Advance, which has a bit higher of a native resolution, it really kind of struggles on this device. It's hard to see. I find myself squinting as I'm playing this. Now that being said, this device is not meant for you like playing on the couch, right? This is supposed to be something that you just throw in your pocket and you just pull out when you're in the grocery line. And it probably serves that purpose, to be able to just play it here and there for a minute. Now not everything is perfect. When I try to change the aspect ratio on the Game Gear emulator in particular, it actually doesn't work. So hopefully they'll fix that in a later firmware update. But like with the Game Boy games, the Game Gear games look really good on this because they're meant for smaller screens. And this seems very unintuitive, but the worst games for me to play on this device were the games that I love. For example, Aladdin. This is a game I've played for 15, almost 20 years. And I have it just memorized, right? But when I was playing this, I was making all sorts of mistakes that I would never do. And that's because of these buttons and the controls. It's just so hard to control it. But you know, if you jump into a game you've never played before, something like say this Metal Slug game on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, it's not so bad because I don't have any expectations for it. Now one thing I really like about this is how easy it is to get in and out of games. If you just close it, it'll save your game and power down. And then to get back into it, all you have to do is just open it up again. And it'll take you right back to where you were when you close the device. Even if you run out of battery, it's still going to work. So here's another example of how it's frustrating. Like I've played Tony Hawk 2 I don't know how many hundreds of hours over the past 20 years. And then the first move I tried to pull off where I tried to grind over the half pipe here, I actually just wiped it. Like that's just crazy to me. It actually made me laugh out loud that I wasn't able to play the way I was expecting to play. And so you may think to yourself, I get to play my classic games on this tiny little device. It's going to be a ton of fun. But what it really comes down to is you get to play a semblance of that game and it's going to probably be frustrating to you when you actually try to play it. Because all those high scores that you're expecting to rack up, they're just not going to happen. It's not possible. As much as I love the novelty of this device and how impressed I am with what it can do, it gets really frustrating when you push a button that you weren't expecting to do. For example, right here with Castlevania. Man, it's frustrating. And the audio just doesn't help. Now that being said, playing PS1 games is pretty incredible. These games run really smooth and they're very beautiful. I would never expect to be able to play something like Wipeout 3 on such a small device like this. And that's a feat in itself. When it came to ergonomics, I honestly didn't really mind it. 
Basically, all you have to do is make two fists and then let the system just rest on your index fingers. It's actually somewhat of a natural way of holding this. Probably not something you'd want to do for an extended period of time, but it definitely gets the job done for a few minutes at a time. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like when you charge it in. It's going to be a blue LED light. And when you plug it into a computer, it actually gives you the ability to mount this device like a USB drive. So you go into the menu and you select mount USB. Now when you go over to the computer, it actually pops up like a USB flash drive. And this is how you're going to edit and add your ROMs. So for example, you can see here, here are all my Super Nintendo games. And basically all it needs is the game itself and then a PNG file that matches that name of the game. And that's how you get them to show up on your device. So it's a very simple, easy way of doing things. And because the device is so small, you don't have to have large file sizes for your images. Now, once you're done transferring things over, all you have to do is select eject USB from the menu. So I want to take a minute and talk about the Funky S website. Typically, I wouldn't talk about the website of a device like this, but this one is really good. It's exceptionally good. On this website, you can read an overview of the device. You can get instructions on how to upgrade your firmware, including download links and how to upgrade it. And all of it is very comprehensive and well-written. Personally, I upgraded my firmware as soon as I got it because I saw there was a new one out and it took me maybe five minutes. Super easy. They have an entire GitHub page which has everything that you could ask for, including a repository for hardware design and production files. Everything is completely open source with this device. The firmware, the hardware specs, the schematics, everything. Coming from someone who writes guides on their website, I know how much work goes into each of these things, and the fact that this is so comprehensive is very, very impressive to me. So my point in bringing all this up is that if you happen to buy one of these devices, you're actually very well taken care of. It'll show you how to install your BIOS files, how to add the other files, what other optional emulators you can add, homebrew, ports, free games, paid games, all that stuff is listed and linked to within the website itself. I've never seen a system at launch have as much information and as detailed as this ever. And if it just so happens that the things you need to find are not on their website between their wiki and their GitHub page and everything else, they actually have their own Discord server as well, linked right in their homepage. And as of making this video, they had nearly a thousand members. So that's pretty awesome. Now this main interface is not the only one available to you. You can actually go into Gmenu2x, and if you've ever used an open Dingux device like an RG350, you're going to be very familiar with this menu. So you can go into these individual emulators and pick out your games this way as well. If you prefer this style, you have it available to you. But within this menu, you're actually able to use other emulators as well as native ports. So for example, there are instructions on how to compile the Super Mario 64 port, just like you can on the 350, the 351 devices, and things like that. And although no other Nintendo 64 game will play on this device, this Mario 64 port is pretty good. Now bear in mind that it's a 240 by 240 resolution, so the text is going to be hard to read. And of course you don't have an analog stick, so playing on this device is not going to be very fun. But it's still a very cool proof of concept. Now there are other games that have already been ported over, for example the Sonic Robo Blast 2 game. And then like I mentioned before, you can load other emulators, and some of these are still kind of in the works. But for example, here's Final Burn Alpha. Now there's some significant slowdown with this, even with games like Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, I was definitely seeing that it was slow. In games like Darkstalkers and any other fighting game, I could definitely feel that it was slower as well. So speaking of fighting games, let's talk about how it is playing fighting games on this device. Now I played a couple rounds of Street Fighter 2 here, and you can see that I'm just trying over and over again to throw fireballs. And I'm landing about half of them altogether. Now dragon punches are even harder. But in general, I would not expect to be able to play any of those Street Fighter style games and enjoy it. Now there's also a MAME 2000 emulator, and this one runs actually really well. You can see here I'm running X-Men at full speed. Same thing here with the Punisher. So if you really want to play arcade games on this device, I would recommend using the MAME 2000 emulator and not the Final Burn Alpha one. Okay, real quick, let me show you how to swap out these buttons. Now conveniently, these buttons all come kind of formed together, so you can actually just swap them out wholesale. You can also remove those little plastic like connector things, and so you could swap out multicolored buttons if you'd like as well. But opening it up here, you can see here's the 410 milliamp hour battery. Removing the shoulder buttons is super easy, you just pop them out. And all you have to do is just remove the battery here just very carefully. And inside here you can see the chipset and the SD card here. 
And then the other side you can see here is the micro switches and the speaker. Now the SD card that comes with the device is 32 gigs, but it can support up to 128 gigabyte cards. Now surprisingly, these buttons are not connected to one another, so you have to just remove them individually. Not a big deal. And then to add the new buttons, all you have to do is just push it in. And like I said before, you could remove the connectors between these and do multicolored buttons if that was something you wanted to do. Putting it back together is super easy. You just do reverse chronological order of what you already did. So here's what it looks like here with these yellow buttons. And I really like these over the white buttons. It gives it a little bit of a Barney the Dinosaur feel to it, but you know, I can live with it. Okay, let's start wrapping things up. Let's start with what I like about this device. Number one, it's a very powerful device for its size. That 1.2 gigahertz CPU is impressive. It has a very simple user interface. It's very easy to jump into this if you're brand new to emulation or if you're an old hand at it. It has some very good quality of life features. I love the fact that you can just close it up to put it into sleep and then you can open it up and resume your game right then and there. It's very easy to transfer ROMs and to update the firmware. You just do it through the micro USB port. And the website and guides that they have for this device are just phenomenal. I've never seen anything as good as this. So if you are gonna buy this device, you are well taken care of from a support perspective. And I love that this device is truly open source. Everything from the software to the schematics, everything's covered. And I think that's really cool. And I think that gives developers a lot of opportunity if they want to work on this device. And it has a very nostalgic feel to it. This whole Game Boy Advance SP feel to it is very nostalgic. And I'll just have to come out and say it. This thing is cute, right? I think that's probably half the draw of this thing is just how cute and tiny it is. When I showed it off to my family, I'm like, hey, look at this thing. Isn't that cool? Everybody loved it. My wife thought it was super cute. The kids were like, oh, you got that for us. Thanks. You know, like everybody loved it. And I totally broke my poor kids' hearts when I was like, nah, man, it's not for you. It's for me. Okay, let's talk about what I don't like about this device. First and foremost, this thing is not comfortable to play. Like the way I hold it with my hands, it's just so small that it's very difficult to play. I think you could do a couple minutes at a time, but anything beyond that, it's very difficult. Even my five-year-old son said it was too small for his hands. And part of that has to do with the fact that the buttons are just too close together. I find myself pushing buttons when I don't want to, and that's very frustrating and annoying. Now the speaker quality I had in my device was very bad. Only a few systems didn't have very blatant crackling, just maybe Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Everything else, when you turn the volume past, say, 50%, it was unlistenable to me. And unfortunately, without a headphone jack, you can't actually ever hear any clear audio. And to me, music is a big deal in playing a game, and it's very unfortunate that I'm not able to enjoy any of the music on almost all of these games. I'm not a fan of micro USB cables in general with retro handheld devices, because most of them have moved on to USB-C at this point. So it's a little bit annoying to have multiple cords hanging out, but it's not a huge deal. Overall, I found that the novelty wore off very quickly with this device. It is very unique and it's really fun to open it up and see how quickly it boots up, but the moment I started playing a game, I wasn't having fun anymore. My overarching question with this device is whether or not the price matches the value of what you get out of it. And at $75 US, I found myself questioning that. As much as I love the novelty of this little device, I never found myself looking forward to playing it. And that's really unfortunate. So really the purpose of any of these reviews is to tell you whether or not I think it's gonna be worth your time and money. And I'm torn with this device. If you are gonna jump into it knowing for a fact that it's a novelty device and it's not going to be your primary emulation device, then I say maybe you can go for it. If you're expecting to play some of your classic favorite games, you know, like the games you grew up playing, Mario 3, Mario 2, and you just wanna beat all the levels and just have fun on a tiny little device, I'm here to say that you're probably not gonna have as much fun as you think you are, because the experience itself of playing these games on these tiny little buttons is actually frustrating for games that you know and love. But I think if you wanted to play like, for example, one-handed RPG games, things like that, I think this would be a good way to just kinda of grind through. Something where the controls really don't matter that much. At the end of the day, if I had to decide between a PAL Kitty V90, which is about $30 to $40 altogether, and about twice the size, but still very small, I think I would go with the V90 every time, because this is something that's just genuinely playable. Where unfortunately, although I love the size of the Funky S, it's the size itself that prevented me from enjoying the games. So I think if you know all that stuff going in, and you really still want to buy it, I think it's a good choice. 
But for everybody else, I think you should be a little bit cautious when you make that buying decision. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.